Hey everyone, it's Lucy and today is a bit of a different style of video for me. Uh, I've done hauls before but this is a very different kind of haul. This is not makeup related, it's not beauty related, it's not even food related. So what the hell is it? Well, you already know because you saw the thumbnail, you clicked on this, you know what this is about. It's random. I've been trying really hard this year especially to get back into reading. I have a Kindle, I have some physical books. It's going okay so far. I'm reading like one to two books a month, mostly one, but that's still not bad. Um, I'm only really reading at night time before bed, so it's, that's why it takes a little while because I'm probably only reading for like 15 minutes at a time. But anyway, I got targeted on Instagram by a really specific ad, which was a mystery box of books that is $100 and you get 30, I think 30 to 35 different books. The one that the ad was advertising was specifically um, a mix of fiction and nonfiction. But then I actually realized this website had other sort of subcategories of mystery boxes. So the one that I decided to go for, um, I have this piece of paper which came straight out of the box. It was called the Summer Fiction Sale Bargain Box and it was $100 and there should be at least 30 books in there. So that is very, very cheap. That's, you know, $3 per book. Very, very cheap. You know, paper books usually cost between, I would say 15 to $30, depending on the size of the book and if it's hardcover or paperback, etc. cetera. Um, I don't, I can't promise that I'm gonna read every single one of these books, but what I wanted to do was show you what I got so you can decide if you've been thinking about ordering one of these random things, if you were targeted by an Instagram ad, then watch this video instead and decide if it's something that you think you need in your life. So I got the books from The Book Grocer. So that is the name, I had never heard of them before. And it was a bit of a risk ordering from a website that I've never heard before, but you know what? It arrived like a day and a half later. So go you book grocer. That's amazing. Um, I have the books in a box down on the floor. I can't physically lift it. It is so heavy. Um, I've cut the top open and I kind of blurred my eyes and tried not to look at anything. I just saw colors and took this piece of paper out and shipping was free. It was just a hundred dollars. Australia wide free shipping and does it say yeah I ordered it on the 10th at 10 p.m. and today what is it the 12th and it arrived like in the morning so yeah a day and a half I'm gonna show you each book one by one and have a bit of a read of the blurb and what I might even do is create piles of books that I want to read and books that I don't want to read the books I don't want to read I will obviously ask Alex and my parents if they want to read it if not pass it on to grandparents friends etc um, but honestly a hundred dollars like that for me was a total risk to spend but if I can get three or four or even five good books out of it then that is honestly the average of what you would pay in a bookstore and also I'm more excited to discover you know the kinds of books that maybe I wouldn't normally have chosen myself so I love fiction and yeah, let's just get into it. Here is the first book. Um, oh, it's a very reflective cover, so I'm gonna hold it like that. Ooh. So the first book, I'm gonna show you guys the cover first and then I'm gonna flip it around. So, The Pianist in the Dark, a novel. I'm not gonna try and pronounce the author's last name, just going to flip right over. Um, a stirring novel of love and music inspired by the life of pianist Maria Theresa von Paradis, a blind virtuoso and friend of Mozart. Yeah, so retails for $13.95 US or $16.50 Canadian. So I'm guessing, pff, honestly, probably $20 in Australia for this book. So it's small, it's, it's small and short. It is only like 100 and 140 pages. So that's a really quick read. So that's going in the yes pile. Yes is to my right. And we'll see if any of the piles stack up, you know, visible on camera. We shall see. All right, I'm gonna kind of pick a book without looking. I'm just reaching my hand into the box. 
Okay. Here is the book. I'm going to lose count, but this is book number two. Um, Mary Adkins, when you read this. Okay, maybe I will. For four years, Iris Massey worked side by side with PR maven Smith Simonyi, helping clients perfect their brands. But Iris has died, taken by terminal illness at only 33. I am 33. Oh. Adrift without his friend and colleague, Smith is surprised to discover that in her last six months, Iris created a blog filled with sharp and often funny musings to the end of a life not quite fulfilled, or on the end of a life not quite fulfilled. Okay, I'm getting goosebumps. Firstly, PR, thoroughly entertaining and enjoyable stories about PR. Secondly, she was 33. Thirdly, secret blog, I'm hooked. I think my friend Harriet should also probably read this because she is a publicist and this one is more of a hefty book. The size of the font looks great. I don't know. Do you guys like watch these kinds of reading um, vlogs and do you do you like knowing about like the font size and stuff? I don't know if that's even a thing, but um, okay, that's acknowledgements. It looks like it's maybe in the 300s. It's about 350 pages. But it's, I guess, a bigger page. Font size, it's all over the place. It's got lots of pages like this. Spoiler, with like diagrams and stuff. So I don't actually think it's as long as it looks. That's going in the yes pile. Excited about that. Here is the next book. Okay, so this is Africa 39. <sighs> New writing from Africa, south of the Sahara with a preface by Nobel laureate Wal Soyinka. It is edited by someone and it's a Hay Festival project in celebration of Port Harcourt UNESCO World Book Capital 2014. So it is, I guess, a collection, let's see, on behalf of a pursuit that, that lures generation after generation to partake of its sumptuous banquet of creative splendors, Welcome Africa 39. So, Oh, from the dazzling list of 39 writers chosen by the judges, Ella Wat Wakatama Alfrey has selected richly rewarding short stories, extracts from novels, fables, and other work by writers from Africa, south of the Sahara, or its diaspora, and created a collection of some of the most varied and exciting new work in world literature today by writers who are certainly going to be among the most celebrated of our time. Okay, I'm going to put that in the yes pile because I love me a short story and yeah, that's really outside what I would typically choose, but honestly, I'll probably love it. Next, so far we're off to a really good start, honestly. These books are like in perfect brand new condition as well. Okay, here we go. Okay. The Treadstone Resurrection, an explosive new series set in the Jason Bourne universe. F yeah. This is right up my alley. Um, I don't know in what order this is though, because I can see on the back the Bourne Enigma and the Bourne Initiative. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if like I need to read another one first, but hopefully not. I've seen the movies, so hopefully not. Operation Treadstone made Jason Bourne, but he's not the only agent they trained. Ooh, it's a new agent. Loves it. Treadstone nearly destroyed Adam Hayes. The top secret CIA black ops program trained him to be an all but invincible assassin, but it also cost him his family and any chance of a normal life, which is why he was determined to get out. I'm not going to keep reading. This is going in the yes pile. Amazing. I'm excited about that. Next. So, so far we have four books that I will absolutely attempt to read. All right. Okay, I already see a really pretty cover. Cool. My Dark Vanessa. Oh, I think I've heard about this. And I actually think, I think this might have been on like a list, but I haven't read it. And I don't think I've purchased it. All he did was fall in love with me and <laughs> all he did was fall in love with me and the world turned him into a monster. Powerful, compulsive, and brilliant, an important book. We should all read it. Vanessa Y was 15 years old when she first had sex with her English teacher. She is now 32. What is with all these characters being close to my age? 
And in the storm of allegations against powerful men in 2017, the teacher Jacob Strain has just been accused of sexual abuse by another former student. Vanessa is horrified by this news because she is quite certain that the relationship she had with Strain wasn't abuse, it was love. She's sure of that. Ooh. I'm not going to keep reading because that sounds really good. It's going in the yes pile. Wow. I should just cancel all other plans because I've got a lot of books to read. Next. So far, these are all paperback, by the way. And, oh, wow. Okay, cool. So this is called Low and the author is Jeet Thayil. And I've stopped telling you how many pages. <laughs> Sorry, just getting to the point. Um, oh, it doesn't actually have a blurb on the back. It just has quotes. Jeet Th Thayil delights not just in pushing the bounds of possibility, but in smashing them to smithereens. Oh, I love the word smithereens. This novel is a rich harvest. It moves with the strange and flawless certainty of a dream. It is superbly written and its madness is also its strength. Ooh. The most original, formerly adventurous and captivating novel to come out of India in a long time. Okay, it's going in the bloody yes pile. Oh, the books, the books are like down here. The pile is gonna, it's gonna appear, I reckon. Okay, digging. And by the way, in the box, there seems to be like four piles of books. And so far, I'm pretty sure I'm only kind of taking books from one of the four piles. <laughs> I'll do a count at the end. Ooh, this one feels, ooh, it's like got a textured cover. Like, oh, it's a hardback. Okay, that's why the box is so heavy. So this is the next one. It's got like a slip cover with a texture, which mm, I think I'll take that off because it feels weird. Okay, so First Person, a novel by Richard Flanagan, author of the Man Booker Prize, prize winning The Narrow Road to the Deep North. Okay, this is quite a heavy book. I'm not the biggest fan of like hardcover books to easily read because I can sort of never really get comfortable. I think I'm gonna have to sit in a chair with my feet up or something, or maybe in bed. Anyway, so these are just reviews on the back. Powerful, funny, disturbing, Flanagan candidly and honestly confronts the raw truths of writing life and the family life, material and spiritual poverty, love and despair and desire. He touches on genuine brilliance, a smart, slippery novel, electric, scathingly funny. Okay. Cause I wasn't sure if this was actually going to be a funny book. Also a profound and thought provoking novel that explores the nature of truth, lies and fiction. Okay. All right. So I think it's kind of going to be a play on like what first person means and maybe be about life and somehow be funny so all right we'll put that on the yes pile for now it was like i was thinking it might be a maybe okay the other thing i'm just noticing now is on the bottom of these books they've got like a like a dot or a line some of them have a line so i think either they mark them as like samples or damaged or maybe that's the reason why they're sold for less but i have no idea maybe if you do know why they mark the bottoms of the books let me know in the comments all right let's go diving for another one Okay, I think we've reached the bottom of one of the piles. Here is the next one. Okay, Benjamin Markovitz, A Weekend in New York. I mean, come on. It's like this box was made for me. Markovitz writing makes the ordinary unforgettable. That's from the New York Times. Tolstoy claimed all happy families are alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. But what if happy families are actually the most unusual of all? Paul Essinger is a my a mid-ranking tennis professional mm, tennis mm, on the ATP tour. I'm not really into that, but if it gets too tennessee, I shall stop. His girlfriend Dana is an ex-model and photographer, and the mo mother of their two-year-old son Cal. Together, they form a tableau of the contented upper-middle-class New York family. But summer storms are blowing through Manhattan, and Paul's relatives have come to stay in the build-up to the U.S. Open. Over the course of the weekend, several generations of domestic tension are brought to boiling point. I'm not going to keep reading. Okay, as long as it's not too Tennessee. Tennessee. Um, oh, there's a little tennis ball there. As long as, as long as it's only that Tennessee, I'll I'll read it. If I'll read one chapter, and if it's too Tennessee, I might have to stop. But it's still going in the S pile, which is just here. It's getting quite tall, and it might fall off the desk. All right, let's go to the next one. Okay. 
This is by Louise Pentland and it is called A Wild Like Me. Um, does anyone else out there feel like me? Robin Wilde is an awesome single mum. She's great at her job. Her best friend Lacey and bonkers auntie Kath love her and little Lila to the moon and back. From the outside, everything looks just fine, but Robin has a secret. Oh yes, I love a secret. Behind the mask, she carefully applies every day. Things sometimes feel dot 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 gray and lonely. She struggles to fit in with the school mum crew. Online dating is despair inducing. And how can she give her little girl the very best when honestly, some days it's hard to find a clean pair of knickers, okay? So I'm thinking maybe this is about someone who's depressed. I don't wanna say no to this book, but I also don't know if I'm the demographic for like a mumsy depression book. So for now, I'm gonna put it on the no pile because I think I know some people who might prefer that book to me. Next. We have this one. Uh, best of the Best, a modern, modern Australian short stories. Tim Winton, Kate Kennedy, David Maloof, and many more. Um, okay, um, I should probably give it a go just because I already know I like Tim Winton. Um, wow, it lists, these are the authors that it includes stories from. And by the way, I'm not 100% sure if you order this box, if you get these exact books or if it's a curation of a larger set of books. I'm not sure. I don't, I honestly didn't read the description. You know, I ordered it at 10 p.m. So, um, uh, I don't think I really need to read the back of this one. Basically, it's a collection of work by like 30 authors, I think. So I'll put that on the yes pile. Oh, yeah, I'll put it on the yes pile. There was almost a maybe. Um, possibly my parents or other family members will like that. All right, next one. So this is 1001 Nights, Hanan Al Sheikh. And it is a treasure box of stories. They link and loop and ensnare the readers, or their readers. 1001 Nights are the never-ending stories, so it's multiple stories, told by Shahzad under, Shahrazad under sentence of death to King Shahryar. Maddened by the discovery of his wife's orgies, King Shahryar vows to marry a virgin every night and kill her in the morning. To survive, his newest wife, Shahrazad, spins a web of tales each night, leaving the king in suspense. When morning comes, prolonging her life for another day, these mesmerizing stories are gathered from India, Persia, and... What? Okay. Wow. So basically, he's sleeping with a wife and then killing her the next day, or like sleeping with a virgin and killing her the next day. And this woman slash girl, because who knows how old she is, knows that and instead decides to tell him a story to prolong and delay, like to delay her death. That's going in the yes pile. Sounds epic. Next. Oh, I have a bookmark, which is cute. So I'll put that aside. I love books. I hope so. Um, all right. Oh, it's a chunky one. Here it is. So Sean Hudson, Omnibus One, Shadows and Nemesis. It's a pretty freaky cover. Um, so, oh, it's two books. It looks like it's two books. Okay. Shadows. In Oxford and Paris, psychic investigators are attempting to probe forbidden, 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 forbidden areas of the mind. In New York, writer David Blake is studying the methods of miracle healer Jonathan Mathias. Driven by their own desperate motives, these researchers are about to unlock Pandora's box and unleash the horrifying forces of destruction hidden deep within us all. Okay. And then Nemesis, Sue and John Hackett are contemplating the ruins of their marriage after the brutal murder of their daughter. Um, to try to salvage their lives, they retreat to the small town of Hinkston, but the town is being torn apart by a series of horrific murders. Okay, so there's just murder upon murder in this one. And it holds a fateful 50 year old secret so appalling that it was supposed to have died during the war. It didn't. 
dot 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 Ooh, that's going in the s pile can you see the books yet nearly they're up here the pile is getting large okay next one the falls my or b michael radburn a secret killing ground dot 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 a century of evil Ooh. a week of despair dot 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 a century of evil damaged but not yet broken after an ordeal in tasmania's wilderness okay if you're watching this and you're not from australia and you don't know where tasmania is please google it right now i'll give you time i'll wait see where it is like all the way down the bottom and it's tiny i've never been there it's meant to be quite beautiful but also um the wilderness down there very very isolated anyway park ranger taylor bridges believes his ghosts are in the past <laughs> until a raging forest fire in an isolated canyon of eldritch falls lays bare the remains of a young woman and a secret killing ground Ooh, okay that's going on the s pile and now you can see the books they have stacked up like this high and I'm going to keep going. I feel like we're not even halfway. This is crazy. Oh, okay. Here's the next one. Graham Hurley, happy days. The reckoning awaits. Okay. So it's very like ominous, like the other one. Notorious criminal Basil McKenzie is now beyond the reach of DI Joe Faraday. Hungry for power and profile, he decides to stand at the next election. The politics is an expensive business, so Baza turns to ex-cop Paul Winter to call in a multi-million pound, okay, so it's British, drug debt. Winter, though, is facing a nightmare of his own and knows that his time with Baza has to end at any cost. I'm not going to finish reading what happens next, but uh, yeah, I'll add it to the pile and I want to ask my mum if she's read that because she reads crime stuff. Next, the dead beat. If you're so special, why aren't you dead? <laughs> okay. Um, the first day of your new job, what could possibly go wrong? Meet Martha. It's her first day as an intern at Edinburgh's The Standard. Put straight onto the obituary page. She takes a call from a former employee who seem, seems to commit suicide while on the phone something which echoes events from her own troubled past. Setting in motion a frantic race around modern day Edinburgh, the deadbeat traces Martha's desperate search for answers to the dark mystery of her parents' past. Doug Johnston's latest page turner is a wild ride of a thriller. Okay, that sounds awesome. I'm gonna put it on the yes pile, which is getting a little, getting a little shaky up here. And no pile is still just this one book. All right. And I have no idea how long it would take me to attempt to read all of these, but, you know, goals, okay? Blood Whispers, John Gordon Sinclair. A hard, tough ride on the wild side that lingers in the mind. With a creepy boat on the front. Kira Lynch is a criminal lawyer. I feel like there's a bit of a crime trend going on. Uh, with a reputation for keeping her clients out of jail. They trust her. She knows how to keep a secret, but Kira has a secret of her own. When her latest case threatens to uncover her past, she realizes that most dangerous person isn't always the one that's chasing you. Sometimes it's the person staring back at you in the mirror. Uh, say, say what you want, do what you will, just don't underestimate her. Yep, I'm gonna try and read that. Okay, so I think we're halfway, approximately. Isn't this fun? I'm really surprised there's not more books that don't appeal to me. A Famished Heart, Nicola White. Another crime. Fabulous Dublin-based crime. Dark, atmospheric, well-written, very much in the vein of Tanner French. I don't know who that is, but okay. Um, the McNamara sisters hadn't been seen for months before anyone noticed. It was Father Timoney who finally broke down the door, who saw what had become of them. Bernice was sitting in her armchair, surrounded by religious tracts. Rosaline had crawled under her own bed, her face frozen in terror. Both had starved themselves to death. Francesca McNamara returns to Dublin after decades in the US to find her family in ruins. Meanwhile, detectives Vincent Swan and Gina Considine are convinced that there is more to the deaths than suicide. 
because what little evidence there is shows that someone was watching the sisters die. Oh, creepy, creepy, creepy. And now the pile is getting right, like, it's very tall. It's like, it's like this tall. Okay, next, and it might tip over, but that's fine. Here we go. This is the next one. The Most Difficult Thing, A Cool New Generation of Spy Novel, and it's by Charlotte Philby. The twists keep coming right down to that chilling last line. Ooh, that makes me want to read it. Uh, what would you sacrifice to uncover the truth? God, so many like rhetorical questions on the back of these books, which I mean, I love a rhetorical question. Don't you? Don't answer that. It's rhetorical. On the surface, Anna Witherall personifies everything the aspirational personifies everything the aspirational magazine she works for represents. Married to her university boyfriend, David, she has a beautiful home and gorgeous three-year-old twin daughters, Stella and Rose. Ah, how perfect. But beneath the veneer of success and happiness, I knew there'd be a veneer or a facade. Anna is hiding a dark secret. Wow, how many of these say dark secret? Um, one that threatens to unravel everything she has worked so hard to create. As Anna finds herself drawn into the dark and highly controlled world of secret intelligence. Okay, didn't see that coming. She is forced to question her family's safety and her own. Only one thing is certain. In order to protect her children, she must leave them forever. And someone is watching. Someone she thought she could trust. Someone who is determined to make them all pay. Ooh. Onto the yes pile. Cool. <laughs> the pile's growing. Oh, okay, next. Here we go. I have to like, it's not that easy to read. Aravind Adiga, Last Man in Tower. Oh, Man Booker Prize winning author of The White Tiger. Ask any Bombay Walla about Tower A of the Vishram Cooperative Housing Society and you will be told that it is unimpeachably pucker. That's in italics, P-U-C-C-A, pucker. Despite its location close to the airport and bordered by slums, it has been pucker for some 50 years, but then Bombay has changed in a half century. Not least its name and the world in which Tower A was first built is giving way to a new city a Mumbai of new development and new money of wealthy Indians returning with fortunes made abroad. When real estate developer Dharman Shah offers to buy out the residents of Vishram Society, planning to use the site to build a luxury apartment complex, his offer is more than generous. Yet not everyone wants to leave. Many of them have lived in Vishram for years, many of them no longer young, but none can benefit from the offer unless all agree to sell. I feel like I've heard about this. It might be based on a true story. Maybe not. As tensions rise, one by one, those who oppose the offer give in to the pressure of the majority until only one man stands in the way of Shah's luxury high rise. Okay, cool. So basically one guy does not want to move and that's what it's about. So that sounds cool. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add that one man to the top of this rickety tower of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So we have 18 books that I might read. And by the way, these are the books that like sound interesting to me. And then I think what I'm going to have to do, because it's a lot more than my thought, is narrow this down further to what I really will read. And what I might also do is read the first few pages of some of these books and let you know if you want to know which ones I definitely am going to read or which ones I want to read first. Just ask away. Um, if you want to know about the font size in any of these, how many pages the book is or the price that's listed on the back because I also stopped mentioning that throughout the video, then comment and I'll let you know. So let's keep going. There's definitely at least 30 books in this box, probably more. Okay, here we go. Um, Little Faith, Nicholas Butler. Alrighty. A novel as tender and generous as any I've read. It's 3 a.m. I gotta get some sleep but can't stop reading sort of book. Heart stoppingly good. Okay. Little Faith is a quietly brilliant book about how love and grief, about love and grief, about what we believe and how we 
engage with the world. Butler has the empathy and humanity of Kent Haruf, but his prose has unique rhythm all of its own. This is profound writing of the highest caliber. Well, I'll give it a go. Um, and if it's a bit too poetic, I'll probably pass, but I'll definitely add it to the potential yes pile, which it's now got to be a potential yes pile because I just can't read that many books. Um, here's the next one. Cool. This is Paul Howarth, Only Killers and Thieves. An impressive debut, and that quote is from Tim Winton, so that's good. One scorching day in Australia's deserted outback, Tommy McBride and his brother Billy return home to discover that their parents have been brutally murdered. Dun dun dun. Distraught and desperate for revenge, the young men set out in search of the killers, but the year is 1885 and the only man who can help them is the cunning and ruthless John Sullivan, wealthy landowner and their father's former employer. Okay, so they rally a pos rallying a posse of men, Sullivan defers to the deadly Inspector Noon and his Queensland native police, an infamous arm of colonial power whose sole purpose is the dispersal of Indigenous Australians, that's not good, in protection of settler rights. The retribution that follows will leave a lasting scar on the colony and the country it later becomes, etc. Um, yeah, I'll give it a go. It sounds like it's possibly not my kind of thing, but you never know. I, I'm going to try it and the pile is now almost above the screen. I think what I have to do is probably make like a second yes pile because it's getting a little tall. So I'm going to take these three books and move them down to the second yes pile. And then you'll be able to hopefully still see my face. All right, next. The Wanderers by Meg Howery. Here we go. Helen Kane may not be the best mother in the world, but she is one of the world's best astronauts. And when at 53, she's offered a chance to train for the first crewed mission to Mars, she doesn't hesitate. This sounds awesome. She and her fellow astronauts, Sergei and Yoshihiro, will be confined in a desert facility striving to prove themselves. Oh, this is like that um, TV show. While outside their loved ones, Helen's actress daughter, Sergei's teenage son, and Yoshi's lonely businesswoman wife pursue complex explorations of their own. All six will find themselves confronting the bonds of love and loyalty, sacrifice and desire. The Wanderers is a brilliantly witty an inventive novel of ambition and death and family that sounds really really good so yes some of them just pop and i'm excited and other ones i'm like i should read this but do i want to here's the next one okay a house of knives by william shaw um it doesn't have a blurb it just says um a first rate police thriller the totemic year of 68 will never seem the same again Excellent dot 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 gripping. Shaw skillfully recreates an era of social turmoil and class conflict. So, best crime of 2013 by the Evening Standard. Okay, that's going in the S yes pile. Cool. There's not really any sci fi or anything, is there? It's all like real and crime. Um, but, okay. Holding this up. Craig Russell, The Devil Aspect. Um, okay. Another question. How do you find a killer when you're surrounded by madness? 1935. As Europe prepares itself for a calamitous war, six homicidal lunatics, the so-called Devil Six, are confined in a remote castle asylum in rural Czechoslovakia. Each patient has their own dark story to tell and Dr. Victor... Victor Kosarek, a young psychiatrist using revolutionary techniques, is tasked with unlocking their murderous secrets. At the same time, a terrifying killer known as Leather Apron is butchering victims across Prague. Successfully eluding capture, it would seem his depraved crimes are committed by the devil himself. Maybe they are, dot dot dot. And what links him with the insane inmates of the Castle of the Eagles? Only the devil knows, and it's up to Victor to find out. Ooh, okay, that's going in the S pile. So still, we only have one book in the no pile. And honestly, it's like a maybe no, because like maybe I'll enjoy it, but also probably not. All right, here's the next one. Justin Hugler, The Return Home. Okay. Autumn 1983. 
Eight-year-old Ben watches from the top of the stairs as a haggard figure limps into the hallway below. Ben's uncle Jack, seriously injured in Afghanistan, is not the same man who left. His return home will throw the lives of his family into turmoil. Set in an atmospheric Jersey, so not New Jersey, like actual Jersey. Oh, actually, yeah, no, it must be. Um, Storm-torn and overshadowed by its Nazi-occupied past, the return home is a gripping tale about growing up, the breaking and mending of relationships, and facing our disappointments in order to move on. Uh, mm, mm. I'm gonna put that in the no pile. I don't know why, it just doesn't doesn't appeal to me. Okay, if you disagree, if you think I should read it, then let me know. Here's the next one. It's a lot of um. Oh! I was just gonna say there's a lot of things with neon, but I just realized. I have two copies of the same book. I don't know if it's that's supposed to happen, um, but okay. I'll put the duplicate on top of the duplicate so that we remember. Oh, hang on. They're not the same. Look, they're not the same thickness. Like, that's so strange. Maybe there's a different font size. I'm gonna step back and see if I can see what the difference is. That is so weird. What is the difference? Why? Why are they not the same? This one has pricing printed on it and this one doesn't. So maybe this was like an editor's copy. That's why it has the line. And maybe this is the actual one that went to print. How many pages have we got? That's this one is 422. And this one is 422. I don't understand. It must just be to do with like the paper. Um, thickness. This one feels nicer. So I think this is like the good copy and the other one is, I don't know. So I'll put them next to each other so that when I do the count, it's accurate, but that's kind of annoying unless it's a really good book and then I can give one to a friend and, and my friend won't have to give it back. Um, okay. Oh, I picked up two by mistake. Thin ones. Okay. Here we go. Peter Carey his illegal self. Um, a richly absorbing novel which can be relished for the beauties of its prose and the pertinence of its themes, the Sunday Telegraph. Seven-year-old Che was abandoned by his radical Harvard student parents during the upheaval of the 1960s and since then has been raised in isolated privilege by his New York grandmother. He yearns to see or hear news of his famous outlaw parents but his grandmother refuses to tell him anything and forbids him to watch television. When a woman named Dial comes to collect Che, it seems his wish has come true. His mother has come back for him, but soon Che and Dial have become outlaws as well, and Che is thrown into a world where nothing is what it seems. Okay, that'll go in the yes pile. That sounds interesting. The next one. It all depends on the style of writing. Like, conceptually, a lot of these books appeal to me, but you know how it is. Like, the style of writing is really, really important. So we'll see. Next, back to Moscow. And I don't like the feeling of the cover. It feels plasticky. So that's going to be like annoying to read, but maybe I'll get over it. Okay. Tuesday night, vodka and dancing. Wednesday morning, posing as an expert at Pushkin, on Pushkin at the university. Thursday night, chasing girls and more vodka. Friday morning, a hungover tour of Gorsky's house. Martin, a young doctoral student of literature, comes to Moscow hoping to discover the country of Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, and his beloved Chekhov. Instead, he finds a city turned on its head where the grimmest vestiges of Soviet life exist side by side with the non-stop hedonism of the newly rich. Along with his hard-living expat friends, Martin spends less time on his studies pursuing instead the mysterious Russian soul in the city's unhinged nightlife scene. In quick-witted prose recalling the neurotic open-heartedness of Ben Lerner and the whiskey-sour satire of Brett Easton Ellis, Back to Moscow weaves an enthralling coming-of-age tale of debauchery and discovery carved from the corpse of the former USSR, an unforgettable and complexly crafted portrait of a chaotic metropolis storming into the 21st century. Hmm. It'll all depend on the style of writing. 
I'm gonna put it here and take a break because I think my camera's getting hot. Okay, I'm back. Let's try and finish this quickly because <laughs> this video is uh, turning out to be longer than I planned, but you know what? That's fine. All my videos are long. You should know that by now. Um, turns out my SD card needed reformatting because even though I deleted all the files, it, it just thought it was full and it absolutely wasn't. So I had to take it out of my camera and put it into my SD card reader and then go to the disk utility and then reformat it. But it's fine now. So I'm also just learning how to actually read at the top of my camera how much recording time I have left. I've never done that before. I've got four hours of recording time left. Woo! But we only have two more books left. The second last book is... Ooh, it's kind of hard to show you because I piled these up. Let me rearrange this a little bit because the pile nearly toppled over. This is the second last book here. So it is called Replay by Ken Grimwood and I really like that cover. It's cool. One of the most elegant and moving time travel stories ever written. Okay, I'm sold. I love time travel stuff. Oh, the back is cool as well. I love this. Um, another question. <laughs> what if you could live your life again and again? Jeff Winston's life is not how he imagined it would be. An unhappy marriage, an unrewarding job, and then he died. Aged 43 and woke up again back in his college room in 1963, age 18. With all his, with all his memories intact, if he applies those memories, he can be rich. He can have anything he wants in this new chance at life until he dies at 43 and wakes up in his 18 year old body again and again in a continuous 25 year cycle each time starting from scratch at the age of 18 to reclaim lost loves make a fortune or remedy past mistakes and then in one replayed life he meets a woman who knows all too well what he is experiencing a superb novel novel <laughs> novel of life, love, and second chances, and what it means to risk everything. Oh, that sounds very good. Okay, so the pile is nearly done, or the three piles. Last book. Definitely, yes, this is the last one. It is Okay, Mr. Field by Catherine Kalea. I had to like hold it that far away to like read it properly. Um, Mr. Field, a concert pianist, traveling back from a performance in London, okay, so there's two piano themed books in these, fractures his left wrist in a train crash. On a whim, he uses his compensation check to buy a house he has seen only in a newspaper. A replica of Le Corbusier's Villa Savoy built on a stretch of coast outside Cape Town. Okay, so it's set in South Africa. When he moves there with his wife, Mim, the house which Le Corbusier Cabussier, is that how you pronounce it? Cabussier? Uh, designed as a machine for living, has a disturbing effect. Okay, Mim disappears without apology or explanation, and Mr. Field can barely summon the strength to search for her. Okay, Mr. Field dwells in the silences between words, in the gaps between conversations, and in the distances between people. It is a novel of exquisite precision and startling imaginative reach. It makes something new. Okay, um, I'm going to say yes, but it's kind of borderline for me based on that description, but I'm going to put it here nonetheless. So really after all of that, these are the two no's because I don't know, they just don't really appeal to me. And I think I could probably narrow it down because like this is just too much. Um, but let's do a count. We've got two, three, four. I'm going to say five because I'm not counting the duplicates of those two. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-nine. Twenty-nine because there's a really thin one down the bottom. So it is exactly 30 books. However, we got the same book twice, which is a bit annoying because I deserve 30 books. So I don't know if I'm going to give feedback on that. Tell me if you think I should give feedback or if you think I should just like get over it. Um, what would you do? Would you complain about the one duplicate out of 30 or would you just go, uh, it doesn't matter. Um, anyway, I'm gonna leave you here 
guess I probably need to go and finish the book that I'm reading or maybe read a few pages of the front of all these books and try and narrow it down. Um, and I also kind of want to have these like stacked up next to my bed so that I feel inspired. Um, if you enjoyed this video and you made it this far, please thumbs up and subscribe. Uh, my videos are random. I don't stick to one particular theme and that's because I don't know. I don't know why. I have lots of interests and so my channel is erratic and all over the place. And if you like that hectic energy, then stick around and I'll see you next time. Bye.